Anthropological fieldwork in Papua New Guinea. This presentation will take you through various aspects, various issues, important ideas that pertain to doing anthropological fieldwork. And I'm going to draw on my own experiences over a number of fieldwork uh, trips over the past 20 years in Papua New Guinea. What really sets anthropology apart from many other disciplines is that we engage in fieldwork. It's the defining aspect of anthropology. That is to say, our data and information ultimately comes from someone going out into the world and spending time with a community, studying with them, living with them, joining them in all the day-to-day -day activities that define that community. Basically, you get your hands dirty. No matter what community you want to study, whether it's a village in Papua New Guinea or Microsoft, in order to understand that community, you have to spend time hanging out with them, living with them, eating with them, working with them, talking with them, doing everything that the community does. And so anthropology is defined by this sort of oxymoron or paradox, participant observation. There's an inherent tension. You have to participate in the community. At the same time, you have to watch them. Obviously, if you're observing them, you're not participating and vice versa. If you're participating in the community, you can't really step back and observe them. So every anthropologist has to find the right balance between participant observation. Before you actually get to your field site and begin your study, there's a couple of basic considerations, and these are fairly obvious, that you need to keep in mind. So first, what are you interested in? What do you want to learn and study about? What key issue or topic? What scientific issue? What moral issue, perhaps, do you wish to pursue? So maybe you're interested in, say, the effects of globalization on a small community in the southwestern Pacific Islands. What do you want to do? Second, you have to figure out where you're going to do it. In a village, in a city, if you want to study tourism in China, where are you going to do it? Is it feasible? How are you going to get there? Where are you going to stay? Where are you going to live? How are you going to eat? You need to secure appropriate funding. Unless you happen to be lucky and be independently wealthy, you're going to need to apply for various research grants. You have to convince these agencies that your study is important, that you're going to find out some interesting and insightful information, that you're going to publicize that information, you're going to use it in the classroom, you're going to write articles or books. It's a long process to secure research funding. Do you have adequate preparation? That is, have you learned everything there is to know about that society before you actually get there? Have you read the relevant literature, scientific journals, and so forth? What language or languages will you need? Do you have the appropriate preparation? Have you taken courses in linguistics? Many countries, most countries I would think, require you to obtain legal permits in order to study a community. Going somewhere as a tourist is one thing, but if you're actually going to engage in scientific studies, you have to often go through various government agencies, various universities. So there's a great deal of basic background information you have to do before you ever even get on an airplane. By now it should be obvious that I did my own field work in Papua New Guinea, which is in the southwestern Pacific Islands, also a region called Melanesia. I'm circling it right here. Here. That's Melanesia. The island of New Guinea is north of Australia, and the eastern half of the island is the independent nation of Papua New Guinea. It received its independence from Australia in the mid 1970s. The country is called Papua New Guinea. Most people abbreviate it just PNG. The people I study are called the Yatmul, I A T M U L, and they dwell along the banks of the Middle Sepik River. Here's another map of PNG. You can't actually fly there directly from the United States. Instead, you first have to fly to Australia. From Australia, you then fly to the capital city, Port Moresby, which you can see on the lower portion of the map. From Port Moresby, I then take a couple of flights hopping along the coast until I end up at the coastal town of Wewak, which is just above the P in the word Papua. That's the capital town of the East Sepik province. Right below Wewak, that horizontal 
um, blue line, which says Sepik River, is the Sepik River. And just to the right of the R in river is the middle Sepik. And I'm just, you know, what, about a quarter of an inch to the right from that R. That's where the village of Tambinum is. So I spend time in a Yatmul village called Tambinum. Here's a nice shot of the Sepik River. You can see, it's really the middle Sepik River. You can see, of course, not much in the way of roads, industries, cities, towns. It's a very rural community. There's only two dirt roads that go to the entire river from the town of Wewak. There is no electricity along the river, no plumbing. The only water is the river you see. It's the main form of transportation. In many respects, the people who live along the Sepik River are at the very remote fringes of the world system. It's not to say they're primitive. It's not to say they're living in the past or left behind. They are as much a part of the world system as you and I, but nonetheless, they're on the fringes of the world system. So, why did I go to Papua New Guinea? The answer is pretty simple. I wanted to study tourism. That is, tourism is an aspect of globalization and how it's changing the small community, the Yatmul, who are at the fringes of the world system. The Yatmul are kind of famous in anthropology. You perhaps have heard of Margaret Mead, a very famous mid-20th century anthropologist. She spent time among the Yatmul. The Yatmul are renowned for their quote-unquote tribal or primitive art. In fact, if you go to the MFA here in Boston, you can see some Yatmul art down in the new African and Pacific Island galleries. There's been a fair amount of tourists who travel up and down the river in tourist boats, which I'll show you in a minute. So I was interested in how all this sort of touristic activity is affecting the people who are living along the river. Here you can see a village along the Sepik, and on the right, of course, is a tourist boat. It's called the Melanesian Discoverer. It was extremely luxurious. There was a lovely dining room and air conditioning and a plush bar. There's a helicopter pad on the top, and it would go up and down the river in the 1980s and 1990s a couple of times a month, and people would come into the community. And obviously, the whole idea behind this kind of tourism is that wealthy Western people would travel to Papua New Guinea in the lap of luxury and try and check out basically the quote-unquote primitive people. You can see a group of Yatmul right here, palm trees, and this is a men's house. It is a ritual ceremonial building that women are not allowed to go into, only men, and the men spend a lot of time basically sleeping, hanging out, preparing for rituals, debating, telling myths, sort of engaged in the day-to-day -day governance of the community. Here's another shot that illustrates nicely tourism in the Sepik River, as well as the inequality of the modern global world system. Obviously, in the foreground of the photo, you can see men and children who are standing up in the main means of transportation, which are dugout canoes. That is, these are canoes carved from tree trunks. And in the background, you can see a large tourist boat. If you want to travel on that boat, you're going to have to shell out about ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 just for the boat portion of your trip. Never mind the expense of flying, say, from Boston to the West Coast, then to Australia. You'll spend a couple of days in Australia. You'll spend a few days in some nice hotels in other areas of New Guinea. So you're probably looking at around $20,000 minimal per person for this trip. $20,000 is more than any of these individuals will probably make in their lifetime, more than their families make probably in a decade. A different tourist boat up the Sepik River, and here you can see very nicely the kind of contrast between, shall we say, poor people who are standing up in dugout canoes and wealthy people who can afford thousands and thousands, probably ten to fifteen thousand dollars to go on that trip. Ten to fifteen thousand dollars is more money than any family along the river makes in an entire year, I might add. 
Here you can see a different tourist boat um, also up the middle Sepik River. And here you see a nice sort of contrast about global inequality in terms of globalization. On the one hand, you have, shall we say, some of the most poor people around the world. The Yatmul generally live on less than a dollar a day. They would be classed by the United Nations as some of the poorest people anywhere on the planet. Here's a couple of men standing up in a dugout canoe. Here's a young boy and a little kid also in a dugout canoe. And here you have tourists who can afford probably ten to fifteen thousand dollars just for the boat portion of their trip. Never mind the hotel in Australia, the airfare and everything else. I should add that none of these individuals never mind individuals, none of their families make ten to fifteen thousand dollars in a year, probably even in a decade. And another photo of the tourist boat. This one is visiting the village I spend time in called Tambanum. I think this photo was taken around 1989. And here you see two final photos that illustrate briefly tourism in the community I spend time in. On the left you can see um, tourists from New York City. It was actually a group of African-American tourists from New York that came to the village and they're lined up there and they're looking at all these sorts of artifacts, crocodile carvings and mass carvings and the front of canoes that people have cut off. These are crocodile spirit prows that people are selling. These are pottery, some more carvings, some shell kind of jewelry frog carvings, various little bits of jewelry and masks and other things. And here's um, men and women on the side of the footpath selling their wares. And here's a house. On the right is a young man who just graduated teacher's college in Papua New Guinea about a year ago. He is my son, not my real son, but I was adopted into a family about which I'll talk about um, in a few minutes. And here is a carving that he made of two birds of paradise and obviously a clock and he is in the town of Wewak. The photo on the left is in the village. Here you see a group of men that I spend a great deal of time working with and they are at the airport in Wewak. Again, Wewak is the capital town of the East Sepik province where I fly into. You will of course notice that several of them are barefoot. Uh, most of them are in this particular instance. That's due to two reasons. One is that when you grow up not wearing shoes, your feet get so tough, especially the soles, and your toes kind of splay out. So it's actually kind of difficult to fit your feet into normal shoes. The other reason they're walking around barefoot is because they simply don't have the money to afford shoes. And this is going to be a very important point that I'll return to later on. Not the issue of shoes, of course, but the issue of global inequality. This is the new main market. It's an outdoor market, of course, in Wewak, and it is just a throng of people selling, what do we have? We have bananas here and coconuts, and back there are um, papayas, and these are greens, and more sorts of vegetables. Those look to be like watermelons. Now, one of the things you need to know is that Papua New Guinea is the linguistically most diverse place on the planet. No other country um, in the world has as many languages. There's over 750 completely different languages spoken in this country. So in this marketplace, in this one town, there's probably 50 or 60 different languages being spoken here. Everybody, however, speaks the sort of national language, which is a pidgin. It's called Tok Pisin. Additionally, a lot of people speak English. Because Papua New Guinea was colonized by Australia for much of the 20th century, the language of formal education, business, and government is English. In much the same way that if you go to many countries in West Africa, people speak French. Why? Because the French colonized the country. In other areas, people will speak Spanish or German, and it all has to do with the history of colonization. 
another shot of the um, the outdoor market in the foreground you can see some greens they're selling for 20 toya a little bunch 20 toya is probably I don't know maybe five cents or so seven cents uh, behind the greens you can see some large papaya then various coconuts the gentleman at the upper left holding the cell phone barefoot is my brother a woman selling peanuts in the town market in Wewak. Now imagine trying to achieve goals you have in life in terms of buying commodities, a car, a house, electricity, new clothing, shoes, school fees, medicine, health care, a computer, cell phone, virtually anything on the profits from selling peanuts, small piles of peanuts for probably, I don't know what they, you know, what she's selling them for, maybe a dime a piece. And you'll realize that it's pretty much impossible to be a full participant in the global economy on the basis of selling peanuts to poor people in New Guinea. So this is one of the moral dilemmas of globalization that we need to think about during this course. A woman in the market selling peanuts. Now, in a course on globalization, I think it's very important for you to pause for a moment, look at this, and ask yourself, what goals might this woman have in life in terms of quote-unquote development or modernization that she could possibly achieve by selling peanuts for essentially pennies a day? And the answer is very little. She can't buy a car, a house, shoes, clothing, much in the way of school fees. She certainly can't buy phones. She can't buy a, a, a electricity, regular water. She can't buy a computer. She can't buy virtually anything we take for granted on the small amount of money you can possibly get every day by selling peanuts. So again, we need to think a lot about global inequality. Many societies in the global periphery, or quote-unquote the developing world, are what we might call kinship-based. And you'll recall from a previous presentation in the course that a kinship-based society is one where essentially everybody in the society is related to everybody else. In these societies, you do not, on a daily basis, interact with strangers. We in the West or in industrialized societies are used to spending most of our time interacting with strangers. We get on the T, we don't know anybody. We go to the supermarket, we don't know anybody. We walk down the street, we even walk down the halls of Wheelock, and we constantly run into absolute strangers. But in small-scale kinship-based societies, everybody is in some way or other related to everybody else. If you're going to do field work in a society like that, you have to be adopted into a kin group that is into a clan or a lineage or a family. In this photo you see my sister Tupa right in the center with her son. Once you're adopted into a family you are in essence a person. Until you're adopted into the family, that is until you have a role in the society, you're essentially a non person. So when you do work in kinship-based societies you have to be adopted into a family. And that raises a very important moral point, which is, once you're adopted into a family, what are your moral obligations? What are the limits of your moral obligations? Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. I've gone, what, I don't know, five or six times. I've spent more than two years studying the Yatmul people from Tambanam Village. You could make the argument that my career including my job at Wheelock, partially rests on their society and their willingness to let me into their community and to have me be a part of their life. Obviously, I am very wealthy compared to them. My sister in this photo is trying to make some money selling these small hand-woven baskets. She doesn't make much money at all compared to, say, a college professor's salary. So what are my moral obligations to them? Should I send them my paycheck? Half my paycheck? That is, what do I owe them? And how do I deal with that in order of sort of balancing my life here 
in the greater Boston area with the fact that I still have ongoing relationships with them. So there's a sense at which when you do field work, not only do you need to be adopted into a family, but you have to spend a lot of time trying to resolve all the different sorts of moral directions and conflicts that you're caught in. The main street in Wewak, and these are two stores. On the right is the Wewak Pharmacy. Um, if you think healthcare is an issue for most Americans, imagine in Papua New Guinea, where virtually nobody has access to even a modicum of healthcare. On the left is the Wewak Christian Bookshop. Papua New Guinea was essentially explored by Europeans beginning in the 1880s. The first Europeans to sail up the Sepik River was around 1885. They were um, from Germany. Germany had colonized that part of New Guinea up through the end of World War I. Now, what were Europeans doing in New Guinea? They were there for a couple of reasons. One, if you are a colonial European country in the 19th century, God forbid another country should have more colonial territories than you. So Europeans spread around the world to compete for political prominence by essentially owning the rest of the world. Second thing you were doing in New Guinea or Africa or any other colonial country is you're looking for cheap raw materials and resources, often things like wood and gold. Another thing you were doing is, quite frankly, seeking souls for saving. That is, Europeans sent missionaries around the world. Europeans believed that they were um, divinely or morally compelled to save the souls of the rest of the world who would be condemned to eternal hellfire if they did not convert to Christianity. And so here you see the Wewak Christian Bookstore. It's the only place in Wewak where you can buy writing material and books, and it all has to do with Christianity. And in fact, literacy or writing was introduced into New Guinea mainly by missionaries. And so there's a kind of association here between Western style knowledge, Western style literacy, reading, writing, and Western style religion, that is to say Christianity. This is the main street in Wewak. Wewak is a pretty small town and there aren't a whole lot of uh, streets, but here's just the sort of the main shopping district, if you will. It is jam-packed. This will be of great relevance later on as we start talking about the course and even as we start reading about young women working in factories in China. Why do people in the developing world enjoy the cities? Well, for the same reason that most of us do. Cities are exciting. There's lots of people, there's lots to see, and there's lots to do. The problem is, in the village, as you'll see as the presentation continues, everybody is more or less equal. That is to say, differences in wealth are pretty minimal. When you get to the cities, however, you begin to realize that you, that is your average Papua New Guinean, do not have money. Yet right in front of you are all these stores. There's cars and, and, and what CD players and radios and cell phones. And so one of the great frustrations about development in the um, um, developing world is this sort of staggering sense of inequality. That is that right in front of your nose are all these products and things that you are basically encouraged to want and yet they're completely out of reach. Now what's interesting is we in the West are used to this. That is to say, we're used to the idea that we live in a society where there are really poor people and really rich people. But in most kinship-based societies, people didn't live that way. They lived in a society based upon sharing or reciprocity. The idea of staggering inequality is new and deeply frustrating. Okay, let's say you've arrived at your field site. Now you have another really important consideration, your informants or your research assistants. Now, from whose point of view are you going to see the culture? 
Let's pretend you want to study Wheelock. Let's pretend that you have no experience whatsoever with the Wheelock, maybe even higher education. You show up on campus, you want to understand what's going on at Wheelock College. From whose point of view are you going to try and make sense of Wheelock? Students? Which students? Men? Athletes? Women? Upper class? First years? Transfers? Are you going to try and see it from a faculty member's perspective? But again, who? In which school? What department? Or the administrators? Does it make a difference if the faculty member or student is African American or Jewish or Irish or Buddhist? In other words, you're trying to make sense of a different culture. You can't possibly understand all perspectives and points of view. Yet, you want to have some sense that what you've discovered about that culture, what you've concluded about that culture actually corresponds to reality. It's actually true to some degree. So how are you going to make sense of this? And one of the ways is you have to select people who act as intermediaries or brokers. And we call them informants or research assistants. So what I did and what many people do is you try to select people who represent different points of view. But Again, you need to acknowledge that it's impossible to represent everybody's perceptions about what's going on. So one of the really important things you have to keep constantly asking yourself is, do you have a comprehensive picture of the culture? Are you actually learning things that make sense to more or less everybody? I mean, if you went to Wheelock and you only studied male athletes who transferred and were interested in human development, you would have a very limited kind of point of view. So you have to constantly sort of ask yourself, am I getting a true and accurate picture of the society and whose voices am I listening to? Whose points of view am I writing about and representing? Here are three men in WeWAC that I generally work with. On the left in the yellow shirt is my brother. In the center is an in-law. And on the right is somebody for whom we just don't even have a word in English kinship. I call him Waranga. He is my father's mother's brother's son. My father's mother's brother's son. And all things being equal, I'm supposed to marry his daughter. I didn't marry his daughter, but my brother did. Some more shots of WeWAC. On the top is a bank branch for Westpac. Westpac is an international bank based in Australia. And on the bottom is a trade store. A trade store is essentially a, what we Americans would call a general store. It's kind of a, a, a small, uh, disheveled, haphazard Target or Walmart, if you will. And this one is called Tang Mao. This is the inside of a small trade store. It just stocks um, rice and tins of meat and fish and essentially ramen noodles and soaps and they probably have cold drinks and some uh, little uh, food bar at the, the top left and razor blades and candy and tobacco and just again you know lots of little sort of household supplies. Lest you think that the Yatmul and Papua New Guinea are far removed from Boston and the United States or that we exist in completely separate worlds, here's some items that I'm sure you will find familiar that are for sale in a trade store in, um, in WeWAC. One kina is about 37 cents um, today. Now, take a look at the, the Coke in the uh, upper right hand um, um, image. 15.9 kina for a six pack. So it's around a buck for a can of Coke. You may recall an earlier slide where I showed a woman in the market who was selling bundles of greens for 20 Toya. 20 Toya is seven cents. So that woman has to sell a lot of greens just to afford one can of Coke. So it gives you, again, some image as to two things. One, global inequality two, 
the fact that we are all connected as part of the same global world. Young people hanging out in WeWack in front of a poster for Maggie Noodles. Maggie is owned by Nestle, and if you go to any supermarket in the United States, you will find dozens of products by Maggie. Women from the village selling baskets by the side of the road in town. Typical Yachtmull house in town. Not exactly lavish, I would say. It's cobbled together by scraps of lumber. The windows are covered with just pieces of fabric and sometimes plastic. There's just odds and ends. There's tin for the roof. It's not the kind of house anybody in Papua New Guinea hopes to live in. Everybody there, like everybody in the United States, aspires to live in a middle-class house. A nice house with electricity, with running water, with furniture, a house that's safe, that's comforting, a house that you can really call home. And the inside of the house, you will see that, yeah, there's a lot of plastic stuff, that same kind of stuff that you and I could buy in Walmart, frankly, the floor is made from a, a tree, so that sort of a hollow tree that you fold out, and that's what the floor is. You can see a fold up dirty foam mattress in sort of the middle. The things hanging from the left of the wall are makeshift mosquito nets, people's clothing, their possessions, their kitchenware. Again, not exactly middle class and not exactly what any Yatmal person aspires to live in. And yet another house in Wewak. You'll see the little boy in the front has a distended belly that is probably from an enlarged spleen due to malaria. And another house. And the kitchen and shower. Most Papua New Guineans who live in Wewak or any of the other cities and towns of the country make their um, living through what's called the informal economy. The informal economy is like selling peanuts in an outdoor market, or selling bananas, or doing odds and ends around town. It doesn't entail any kind of structure. There's no regular work hours. Obviously, you don't get a paycheck. You don't get benefits, you don't get health insurance, you don't get retirement account, you, you, know, you, you, you get paid only what you can sort of scrape together. It's not a very secure livelihood and you never make much money. Essentially, these women are hoping to sell enough peanuts every day so that they can buy food to eat for their families. Doing anthropology in a place like Papua New Guinea is a joy, it is a privilege, it is an honor, it is, without exception, some of the high points of my adult and professional life. When I look back upon my 53 years, I can really say that few things have rivaled just the sheer experience of living and spending time among the Yatmol in Papua New Guinea. It is wonderful. At the same time, it is tough. It is morally anguishing. Let's face it, I am wealthy, and so are you. You might not think you're wealthy in the context of the United States, but compared to the vast majority of the world, you and I are wealthy. We live in one of the most affluent communities in the most advanced, powerful, and affluent country in the world. The opportunities we have before us are enormous compared to the people who live in the village of Tambanum. We have so much, and they have so little. It's not our fault that that's the situation. It's not their fault that that's the situation. Yet here I am doing anthropology in their community, and there's no way around it. I have so much, and they have so little, and they have so little power. 
So you're an anthropologist from a wealthy industrialized country, the most wealthy and powerful country in the world, and you are studying some of the poorest people in the world. Worse, people who have no true voice in global affairs, a people who do not really matter as far as the rest of the world is concerned, except as primitives for wealthy tourists to behold as in some sort of human zoo. I'm not saying the Yatmo don't matter. What I'm saying is, as far as the world is concerned, they don't matter. If they mattered to the rest of the world, you would have heard about them before. But let's face it, the vast majority of the world's powerful, wealthy elites, the vast majority of the world's governments, don't pay a whole lot of attention to 10,000 yacht mole in the Sepik River of Papua New Guinea. They don't, sadly, matter. How are you, as an anthropologist, to respond to this situation? How do you respond to this inequality? What do you do, if anything, about the gap in power and wealth? It is not easy to conduct field work among the world's poor. Do I owe the yacht mole something? Do I have a moral obligation to do anything to help them? If so, how much should I help them? What am I supposed to do? What should I do? What would be an appropriate response? It's very important that we learn and study other cultures, but we have got to ethically grapple with the inequalities and really some of the emotionally wrenching circumstances in doing field work. There is, in many respects, often a terrible emotional burden in doing field work that resists any simple solution. If you are not ethically troubled by global inequality while conducting field work in the developing world, then you are not paying attention. Quick example. When's the last time you heard of a kid in the United States dying from snake bite? Or dying from diarrhea, or dying from cholera, or dying from malaria. Probably not very often. In the village I spend time in, kids regularly die, even when I'm there, from things like getting bit by a poisonous snake. In the village, my adoptive brother, he has two wives, we'll talk more about that as the course unfolds, about two years ago, one of his wife's son was playing in the tall grass. He was bit by a poisonous snake, and the only thing his mother could do was hold the child while he died. There is no health care. There is no place to go for assistance. There is nothing to do. Kids in Papua New Guinea die of snake bite in the 21st century. To us in the United States, that would be unheard of. What are the ethical obligations of doing field work in the developing world? I do not have an answer to that question. The only thing I can say is it is well worth paying attention to, and if you are not emotionally distressed by the inequality in the situation that you are seeing and participating in when doing field work in a place like Papua New Guinea, then you are just not paying attention. This is a very serious issue that should plague every anthropologist while they're engaged in their field work. Very few Papua New Guineans have anything approaching what we would think of as a job. My sister, however, does. You can see here in the back, her name is Skola Mapat, and she has been working for, what, 20, 25 years as a clerk in the WeWAC courthouse. And here is her office. I actually uh, correspond with her quite frequently by texting and email. She is the only person in a village of a thousand. And you'll see pictures of the village as the uh, presentation goes on. She's the only person in a village of a thousand who has a regular job in town. She earns about 750 kina a fortnight, that is every two weeks. So she's earning probably around you know, 250 bucks every two months. With that money, she has to pay uh, rent for her house. She pays for electricity. She pays 
for um, some food, she pays for water, she also is trying to support kids who are going to school. She is not exactly middle class, but she's very close to middle class in Papua New Guinea. Here is her house. It's two stories. There is concrete for a floor. It does have electricity and water, as I mentioned. On the left, you can see a corrugated iron water tank that traps rainwater from the roof. Um, there's a, um, she has a TV. You can see the kitchen, part of the kitchen on the outside. Again, it's not exactly middle class, but in terms of Papua New Guineans and urban or quasi-urban um, living, this is pretty good. Her living room. Now again, not middle class, but pretty good. In the foreground you can see some old furniture, but furniture nonetheless. There is a carpet, there is some fading vinyl floor mat that's on the lumber floor. She has a television, you can see um, a couple of pictures of Jesus. In the back right corner, hard to make out, but that is an effigy. That is a figure of her husband who died about 15 years ago, and that figure was used at his funeral. On the right is a hallway, and sort of at the back on the right is a piece of fabric that serves as a doorway, which um, covers one of the bedrooms. Public transportation in Papua New Guinea? We Americans tend to think of cell phones as sort of the cutting edge technology. We think of the iPhone or the Android or something like that. But as it turns out, cell phones are, or mobile phones as they're more properly known, are ubiquitous today in the developing world. In some parts of Africa, for example, far more people have cell phones than they do normal landlines. The same is true in Papua New Guinea. In terms of infrastructure, it is a lot easier to connect people via mobile phones than anything that has to do with wires. In America, when we buy a cell phone, we end up having to spend a lot of money paying for the phone, and then we set up one of these two or three year contracts, and you need a steady income to actually sustain it. In places like Papua New Guinea, cell phones are relatively inexpensive. They really are, you know, 20, 30, 40 bucks. So you buy your phone, but you don't actually buy any kind of plan. What you do is you buy um, what looks like lottery tickets in, in denominations of time. So you buy a kind of the equivalent of, of what would be, say, a $1 ticket, a $5 ticket, a $10 ticket, a 50 cent ticket. You scratch off the kind of part of the ticket and then it gives you a number and you type that number into your phone and then you get that amount of time five minutes ten minutes or whatnot and so these little scratch cards these prepaid phone cards are everywhere in papua new guinea even though most people have no access to electricity and they don't have any actual cell phone contracts so what do you do if you don't have electricity but you have a cell phone you go to a store like this and behind the woman on the counter are all these mobile phones and people pay a couple of cents to have them charged. Behind her are, just immediately behind her are all sorts of lanterns and flashlights and on the right are a bunch of batteries. All right, we're now on our way to the river. Myself and a couple of the guys I spend time with, we piled into this particular vehicle in uh, a couple of years ago in Wewak, and we proceeded to take it on a four-hour trip along a dirt road to the river. And here we are on our way to the river driving through the uh, jungle or the rainforest. the equivalent of the Papua New Guinea Dunkin' Donuts. So we're a couple of hours outside of Wewak on our way to the river, and like many such public transportation trucks, we stopped here for, you know, some people had a smoke, and some people had some coconut water, and some people had a snack, and just to stretch your legs. 
beetle nuts. These are used throughout Papua New Guinea and many parts of the uh, tropics around the world. So these round looking things are beetle nuts and they grow on um, small palm trees. And what you do is you chew off, you bite off the green skin and inside is a kind of whitish yellowish nut and you can see one of them that's got half the skin off. You chew that nut with those long peppers that are also in the foreground of the image and you take the peppers and you moisten them with saliva and you dip them in lime powder. Lime powder is sort of the stuff that you put down on a, a soccer field frankly and so the lime and the pepper and the betel nut combine and it turns your saliva blood red and you actually salivate quite a bit and so you end up spitting what looks like blood all over the place and it's a stimulant it's probably best understood as about 20 cups of coffee all at once you can um, break out into a sweat you get kind of giddy if you're an anthropologist you have to put down your pen and paper and kind of sort of chill out for a couple of minutes and regroup before you can concentrate and get your work done. But people do this stuff all the time and everywhere in the country. It's sort of uh, a social lubricant, really. Beetle nut. And at our local Papua New Guinea and Dunkin' Donuts, here is a young woman who is selling taro root for a snack. About four hours later, we make it to the river, and this is truly the end of the road. The road stops here, and there will be no more roads for, what, another hundred kilometers up and down the river. We unload all of our gear, and I might add that the plastic containers, those white containers, are filled with drinking water. I try not to drink the sepik because you can actually get quite ill, or, or I certainly can. Um, it's not exactly uh, uh, clean. It's not polluted with sort of industrial chemicals, but there are lots of parasites and things like that in it. So I try to bring down water, and then when I run out of water, I use various sorts of filters. Anyhow, we've you know, dumped all of our gear by the side of the road. And we pile our stuff into a fiberglass dinghy with an outboard motor. or else we put all of our stuff into a very long dugout canoe made from a tree which also has an outboard motor and here's my brother loading up the canoe and we head up river this is the town of Angorum what we're now leaving and that's where the truck dropped us off and we're now going to proceed up the river about four hours and we head up river and keep going and we keep going, passing a man who's paddling a canoe. The Sepik is this enormously serpentine, curving river, and very often there's sort of smaller channels that cut across the main river, and that's what we're doing right here. We go past another canoe, and we keep going. Here we're coming up on a small hamlet through one of these smaller streams or channels and a woman doing the dishes. Here's a shot of Tambanum Village in the late 1980s from the top of one of the tourist boats that went up and down the river. My house at the time was right by that really tall palm tree in the middle of the village. You can see on the shore various dugout canoes and all the houses are sort of back inside the, uh, the trees. Another shot of the village from the uh, roof of the tourist ship if you look at the building on the left of the screen, that's another one of these men's houses where, again, only men have access to. Each clan has a men's house. And the building in the center of the screen is just a large domestic house. A mother and her young child in the morning, they're paddling the canoe um, downriver to set fish traps, which they'll retrieve in the evening. How do you gain the trust of the people that you're studying? What does this mean? What do you owe people? What do you need to do in order for them to trust you? And conversely, what are you willing to tell them? To what extent can they trust you? 
It's very important in doing anthropology that you are honest about your intentions. In fact, the American Anthropological Association specifies that no anthropologist should ever lie about what they are doing. We are not spies. When you're doing field work in another community, you must inform them that you are A, an anthropologist, B, that you are studying them, and C, you need to seek their consent, that is, their approval for doing your anthropological study. You cannot just spend time in a community and pretend that you are just a regular person or a traveler or anything. You must be honest. Otherwise, to say the obvious, why should people trust you? However, when you trust people, it means that they actually tell you information that perhaps they wouldn't otherwise, so that you know things about their lives that makes them perhaps vulnerable or maybe even legally vulnerable. Conversely, people are going to ask you questions and they expect you to treat them with the same amount of integrity and honesty. What does it mean to trust people? What is trust cross-culturally? What is trust when you are wealthy and come from the United States and they are poor and live in Papua New Guinea? Can that ever be a fully trusting relationship? Is it an equal relationship? Is it a real relationship? What does it mean? Again, there's a lot about doing anthropology that involves the, the humanistic, interpersonal aspects of the study. Look, if you're a geologist and you go out into the field and you study rocks, you don't have to negotiate any kind of moral relationships with the rocks. The rocks don't talk back. The rocks don't make expectations. The rocks don't want things from you. They don't, they don't, they don't talk to you. They don't tell you their secrets and their dreams and their frustrations. It's very different when you're dealing with people. It entails emotions, it entails feelings, it entails people's lives, it entails issues of trust and decency and integrity and honesty. And it's very hard to balance all of this humanistic, subjective stuff that goes on in field work and still do the scientific study. There's an enormous balance that must occur between the fact that on the one hand, you're there as a scientist to study people, but on the other hand, you're there to forge interpersonal, real relationships with humans. How do you balance the professional and the personal? There's no recipe for how to do that. Let me follow up a bit on the previous slide. How do you balance your professional obligations with a personal sense of decency and respect? Or how do you be a scientist and a humanist at the same time? This is my brother's wife. She's the mother whose child died a couple of years ago after he was bit by a snake. When I visited in 2010, the death had happened only a few months earlier, and you can see around her neck mourning bands, and also on her wrists, and if you could see them, her ankles. These bits of twine are what people use to tie around their sort of appendages after um, they've suffered a loss. It's a way of sort of binding their soul so that they don't lose themselves, lose their sense of self in grief and basically die from mourning. So it's to kind of tether their soul here to earth into their bodies. It's a way of letting other people know that they're mourning. It's a way of allowing them to mourn but it's also a way of making certain, of reminding them to not get lost in their mourning. This is extremely sad. She lost her child to snake bite. If you're an anthropologist, one of the things you want to study in a community like this are mortuary and death practices. How do people grieve? How do they mourn? What are their funerals like? What are their mourning rites like? You, you, you can't ignore something like death just because it's an emotionally anguishing topic. You go to another society and you refuse to ask people about difficult questions. You refuse to follow up and study things because they make you or others feel uncomfortable. You're not going to learn anything worthwhile. You're going to end up writing basically a Disney movie about another culture. You have to talk about the really difficult 
emotionally anguishing things like death. On the other hand, you don't want to be a son of a bitch. Forgive my, uh, my, uh, my English. That is to say, you want to respect the fact that the poor woman has suffered the death of a child. You're not just going to put a microphone in her face and start barraging her with questions. So somehow, you have to sort of wear your scientific hat as well as your humanistic hat. Remember, you've received a research grant from an agency to go do a study. In my case, I received a particular grant to go back to Papua New Guinea to, to, to study certain issues in 2010 having to do with um, um, finance and money. The agency that supported my research expects me to come back with exactly what I said I was going to do. They don't know exactly the information I'm going to find out, but they've given me money in order that I can find out information about specific topics, and the understanding is that I will write up those issues and publish my findings. That's what I've been given research grants to do. For me to not do that would be dishonest. It would not be appropriate to my discipline. It would not be appropriate to the grant agencies. It is dishonest, never mind illegal. On the other hand, you don't want to be a cold-hearted SOB. You want to respect people's emotions. You want to respect their feelings. You also want to remain true to your own sense of decency, your own sense of what is right and wrong and good and bad, your own sense about how you should treat other people. So in doing field work, one of the really difficult issues is constantly balancing your scientific obligations with your humanistic sense of self. Constantly balancing the need to get data with the need to be a decent, respectful, compassionate person. And finding that balance is extremely difficult. Kids paddling to school in the morning. A mother and her kids paddling to the other side of the river. No matter where you end up doing field work, whether it's at IBM or Microsoft or Apple or in Papua New Guinea, at some level you're going to have to grapple with culture shock. Culture shock refers to a situation where essentially the norms that govern your life as you're used to, no longer apply. So here, for example, is a situation that you would probably never see in the United States. Four kids, very young, playing all by themselves with absolutely no adult supervision whatsoever by a large, swift river in which there are occasionally crocodiles. Now, if you try to do this in the United States, somebody's going to call the Department of Children and Families and you're probably going to lose custody relatively quickly. Papua New Guinea, this is completely appropriate, normal, ethical, proper moral parenting. It violates so much that most American parents hold dear. So now you're in a situation where your own norms as to what's the proper thing to do is completely violated by the community that you're studying. And so culture shock is really about being in a completely different situation. And often you see and experience things that violate your very most basic moral principles. How do you deal with this? If culture shock gets to you, then you actually can't do anthropology. Basically, you have to go home. That is to say, you can't let the shock of the situation overcome you. On the other hand, you need to pay attention to culture shock because that often points out interesting differences between cultures. Regardless, it's something that you just need to experience. And sometimes you can actually become very angry. You can become depressed. You can be sad. You can be surly. You know, it can be a little bit much. Um, um, constantly coming up against a completely different culture. If, as a kid like I did, you watch Star Trek, then I'm sure you know about the Prime Directive. The Prime Directive prohibits Starfleet personnel from interfering with the internal development of other civilizations around the galaxy. 
This conceptual law applies particularly to civilizations which are below a certain threshold of technological, scientific, and cultural development. The Prime Directive prevents starship crews from using their superior technology to impose their own values or ideals on them. In short, the Prime Directive in Star Trek prohibits Star Trek crews from ever interfering in the natural development of societies on the planets they encounter. Does anthropology have a prime directive? The answer is no. But things are not quite that simple. Anthropology as a rule doesn't have any kind of guiding principle that says you should or you shouldn't interfere in the society that you're studying. It's up to each individual anthropologist to decide the extent to which, if at all, they will interfere, as it were, in the culture. What does it mean to interfere? When should you do it? How? Why? To what ends? What are the repercussions? Do you give medicine to kids? What if you don't have enough for all the kids in the village? Do you give it to some? Do you not give it to any? Do you help pay school fees for some, not for the others? Do you interfere with a fight? Do you say, as in this example to parents, what are you crazy letting your kids play unsupervised in a river? Do you try to teach them to change their culture, their values? How about if you were a deep believing Christian? or a deep believing Jew or Muslim, can you go to a society in New Guinea and say to them, hey, you know what? I think your traditional beliefs and ancestors is wrong. I think you should believe like I do. You can, as it turns out, do that. There's no rule preventing you from doing it. There's no rule whatsoever saying that you can't interfere or try to change another culture. But you need, of course, to be careful. Why are you changing another culture? Are you that certain that your way of life, that your moral values, that your outlook is far superior to theirs? How do you know that your well-intentioned changes might not at some point down the future end up having really bad effects? How do you know it won't cause some people enormous hardship or pain or suffering? Every act we do has unintended consequences, of course, all the more so when, say, an American tries to alter a culture in Papua New Guinea. So another fieldwork issue that you need to keep in mind is to what extent do you interfere? How do you try to shape social events in the community? Do you try to dissuade people from doing things? For example, when I first went back in the uh, late 1980s, the village of Tambanum was in a fairly significant feud and fight with another village over the ownership of a stream, a, a, a very um, um, a rich sort of small ecosystem with a lot of crocodiles, <coughs> excuse me, birds and fish and turtles, and both groups wanted to use it for, for sort of food and, and to garden there and to set up some settlements, and there had been a number of fights, and um, um, during one particular fight which I witnessed, a man from the other village uh, was stabbed with a knife and, um, and died. And so this was a huge issue, and the other village was uh, understandably very angry, and they wanted vengeance, and there were lots of skirmishes and fights. And one day, a couple of men from Tambanum said to me, they said, look, Eric, we'd like you to go into town and buy us some shotgun shells, because we want to go to this other community and solve the problem once and for all. Now, think about that. They wanted me to buy, essentially, shotgun ammunition so that they could go and kill people from another community. Should I have done it? What would you have done? Should I have tried to dissuade them from it? Should I try to somehow weasel out of it? What would you have done in this situation? To what extent would you have interfered? Or would you have done what they said? Or would you have flat out refused and perhaps called into question their trust in you? These are the kinds of issues, moral issues, that anthropologists grapple with day to day when they're doing field work.
a typical yacht mole house getting from one side of the village to the other. Just a bit more on culture shock. So this is basically the beach or the river bank and you can see the dugout canoes moored in the, uh, in the water. This is um, your source of water for everything. That is, if you live in the village, this is the water for drinking, it's for cooking, it's for laundering, it's for washing, it's for bathing. And so every evening, just as the sun was setting, I would walk out here with my soap and uh, shampoo and uh, towel and wade out into the water and lather up and wash and much to the amusement of many kids and uh, walk back again. So when it comes to culture shock, one of the things that you also have to deal with is adapting to life in the community. In other words, you want to understand the world through their eyes, through their point of view. So you actually, you need to be there as much as possible. And this raises a really important question. When you do field work, you want to go to the community. You want in some real sense to quote unquote, be there. But what does it mean really to be there? That is to say, at what point can you know that you are there in a real significant way such that you have reason to believe that your conclusions and your information about the community are insightful and valid? Now, this doesn't make a difference whether you're doing field work in Papua New Guinea or you actually want to go across the street and study Simmons College. If you're a Wheelock student and you want to study Simmons, you're going to do ethnography at Simmons, you're still confronted by the same question. What does it mean to be there at Simmons? To be there in a significant, deep, intensive way such that you feel secure in your knowledge, that you understand what's going on. What does it mean truly to be there?